So we are, we are very happy to have uh, Ludo here with us uh, talking about private equity markets. Uh, Ludo is uh, among very, very few, in fact, who has studied private equity so many years and also have a very strong link with the industry. Ludo has shown an inconvenient fact about private equity return, which has created a massive debates in the field. Ludo is also the author of one of the most interesting novels, uh, sorry, uh, private equity books uh, called Private Equity Ledbear. And I say novels because it's written in a novel style. In Ludo's own words, uh, Ludo has two main hobbies, tasting great wines and racing road bikes. But unfortunately, he does not manage to enjoy this at the same time. So thank you for having me. The vocabulary in private equity is very important. Uh, it's, it's, the jargon is very thick. And, and it's very quick to pick somebody who's not familiar with private equity because they don't use the right words in the right way. So it's it's really a different language and, and a mindset. And so if you have um, any intention to work in private equity, you know, most of the companies you know of, Preta Manger, uh, any 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 like chain of bakeries in France, any chain of restaurants like Pizza Express, etc. All these guys are, are, are in private equity hands. So even if you just plan to just run a business or create a business, chances are you're going to interact with private equity and therefore you need to know the vocabulary. The woman here is called Alice and Alice has an idea. And this idea is an investment idea. She has this idea that she sees this house for one million pounds and she can do something to it that will make it worth more. So she has this idea of how to improve her house, but what is important is that Alisa doesn't really have much money. Now, Alisa will need some sort of track record. She will have to show to people that she has done these things before uh, because she will have to raise money from other people. Okay, so she's gonna invest other people's money. And so you have this bag of money coming from the banks and other specialized lenders. And then the rest of the money is gonna be the equity to the house. And that's gonna be provided by sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, high net worth individuals, family offices and endowments. Basically, effectively, Alice is like buying this house, but it is the house that has borrowed the money. The goal is really like textbook economics 101, pure profit maximizing. I wanna make as much money as possible. I see an asset, I have a plan to make it worth more. I, I execute my plan. I sell it, I pocket the money, and nothing else matters. When you enter these transactions, when you buy it, you already know who's, what is it going to look like when you're going to exit it, and who is going to be a potential buyer for these sorts of things. And so at the end here, you have then you sell this asset, you have a payoff, everybody gets some, some, some money, etc., and, and, and it's included. All the space that is called impact investing, for example, which is very hot at the moment, all functions like this. You have a company that you want to uh, uh, improve. It could be you know, that you want to improve it socially. And you buy this company, you execute the transaction exactly in that fashion, and you exit it, and you have generated the impact you were seeking, hopefully. So, so all the space from infrastructure, real estate, uh, leveraged buyout, venture capital, growth equity, impact investing, all of these uses the same structure. Alice has just spotted an investment opportunity and she makes it happen. If a journalist knows private equity pretty well, the journalist will not say Blackstone bought casinos in Spain. He will say Blackstone sponsored the, the, the acquisitions of casinos in Spain. Because here, if you've paid attention to the way it was set up here, Alice is not buying anything. She's not owning anything. She's just advising everyone. She's directing the money of endowments and pension funds into an asset she's been from banks but that is really the asset that is borrowing she's just organizing the whole thing she's controlling the board of directors but she's not owning anything and in fact if you apply to jobs in private equity often you will apply to like Tamira advisors kkr advisors they often have advisors in their name because that's what effectively what they are they are just advisors you can only underestimate how many things you know are in the hands of private equity the water we drink in Oxford, uh, Thames water is in private equity hands. About any amusement park you know of is in private equity hands. The only one is Disney that isn't. But you take Park Adventura in, 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 in Catalonia is, is private equity. You take um, all the amusement parks in France, including Park Asterix, etc., they're all in private equity. Because you have created one new core, one bitco to take over every asset you have uh, sponsored, 
then if one goes bankrupt, all of this goes bankrupt. So if you're running a hedge fund and you're making a bet that is going wrong, you need to sell the other bets in order to cover the bet that is going wrong. In private equity, you sponsor the number of transactions. In one company goes bankrupt, that's it. It's this company's problem. Is this company that has borrowed the money? Uh, yes, that allowed you to buy it. But that's a company who ended up with the money, the debt on their book. And if a company cannot pay, this company goes under. None of the other companies in your portfolio goes under. Um, and that has been a lot in the news with this a pandemic, because obviously people have been saying private equity holds tons of companies. So if some of them are going bankrupt, they should use the other ones to pay. Rather than the government rescuing every asset that is not going well in private equity. And then private equity is benefiting, meanwhile, from all the assets that are going well in the portfolio. The example I showed here would be a so-called deal-by-deal transaction setup. So that does exist, but KKR wouldn't bother with that. So if you replace Alisa by KKR, um, when you are starting in this business, usually you have to do it like Alisa. You have for each transaction, you need to have everybody to agree and, 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 and you execute your transaction. When you are a KKR, you tell people, look, give me, give me your, a credit card, basically. You commit money to me for the next five years and you say how much, and then I'm going to go and shop. And whenever I find something, I call money from you, okay? And, and I'm not going to bother you with like, you know, you having to say yes or no each time. So there's a question. Major PE funds currently have a significant amount of dry powder, while the LBO market hasn't recovered, at least in Europe. Do you think this situation will squeeze sponsor return targets in the long run? It, it, it's a very good question. I think there are many reasons why uh, the, the, the LBO returns will be lower uh, going forward. Um, I think that's an almost a certainty. The, and, and often people, like, 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 like you say, uh, point at the dry powder for the intuition for that. Uh, and that's not the right way to look at it. But, but that's how all the journalists are looking at it. So, so like everyone makes, makes that mistake. Uh, the reason why dry powder is not an interesting statistics to look at is because dry powder is all the money that has been committed and not called yet. And so basically, when you have uh, uh, committed money, you spend it roughly 20% every year. So the amount of dry powder is just a direct proportion of how much money there is under management. If private equity tomorrow raises twice as much money, they have twice as many commitments, then the, the dry powder will be double in absolute amount. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's proportional, right? If it shrinks by half, the dry powder will shrink by half. You always have about Half of the money is not called yet because you have five years to invest it and, and you invest it regularly. So about at any point in time, half of the money is not invested and half of the money is invested. So the dry powder is always half of the total size. And people always talk about this dry powder like, oh, they have all this cash they need to spend and it is so much money that they need to buy so much stuff. Sure, but, but, but it, it's just that it's the asset under management. It doesn't, dry powder is just like a proportional thing that is very mechanically related to how much money they've raised. So the more interesting statistic to keep track of is how much money they are raising. Uh, so how much money they raised last year, two years ago, how much money is, 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 is being directed towards private equity. And, and, and dry powder is a proxy for it, but that's not the most direct way to measure it. Um, so, so, so yes, and a lot of money has been raised in private equity. And historically, and especially when it gets raised for a certain sub-segment, the returns are bad. So the segments that are, are very hot right now are things like infrastructure, uh, private debt, um, and, and also leverage buyout US and Europe, venture capital US and Europe, uh, China growth. Um, this is very hot. What is not hot is um, maybe growth capital Europe, uh, private equity uh, Amer South America and, 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 and Africa. Uh, private equity, Japan, all these things are not very hot. Um, Russia, certainly, Eastern Europe. And so there, there is where there is much less money going uh, into it. And so you, how historically that would be an indication that the returns would probably be relatively better in these geographies than the one everyone is chasing. It is basically nearly impossible to get a job in there. Like, like you, you typically... Blackstone will, will look only at someone who has like 20 years of experience in, in, in Boston Consulting Group 
for, for a young person to start in Blackstone is nearly impossible. I've had students who managed but here and there, but it's like one a year. My rough advice is to try to go into private equity from a different route. So try by taking first jobs maybe in pension funds, in private equity divisions, in pension funds, in entities like consultants and the like that interact a lot with private equity funds. And, and then they will spot you. So and so you need to look at the path of lowest resistance and, and think that you really are interested in. And so you have all kinds of jobs that are satellite to private equity. For example, if you're very strong in law, then you may take a job in a law firm doing a lot with private equity, and then you will interact with the legal people in a private equity fund. And maybe you will enter into the legal department of private equity fund and then way move into uh, other positions in that firm that gets closer and closer to maybe deal making, which is what you want to do. If, if it's deal making, you can also think about investment banking and you get into investment banking. Some investment banks are doing a lot more of private equity than others. Same thing, you will work on some deals with private equity firms and they may spot you and, 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 and hire you. You have different private equity firms that work differently as well. So you need to, to look and to talk to a number of them because they, they will all have different uh, philosophies. But sometimes it can, it can be in line because imagine that you own BMW and the private equity firm will come in and say, how do I make BMW worth twice as much in four years time? Well, you will manage to do that by positioning BMW for the future pretty well. And so if in four years time, you know, you haven't positioned BMW extremely well for the future, then you know, it's, it's not gonna work. So even though you may have an infinite horizon, Somebody coming in and say, in three, four years' time, I need to position this company to, so that it's worth as much as possible may actually be the best for you in the long run as well. So it's not always uh, contradictory, and different private equity firms will have different approaches, and it's up to you then to judge which one will, will work towards your long-term goal. The problem with private equity returns is what is quoted is typically uh, uh, not the right way of measuring returns. Um, a lot of misleading statistics and marketing is given about private equity returns. If you measure it properly, uh, in a nutshell, is that it depends on the benchmark you're using. So private equity returns basically have returned 11% uh, 11 net in the US is where we have most of the data. I, I won't comment outside of the US, but it's 11% net uh, from the mid-90s to the financial crisis, and it's again 11% net uh, after the financial crisis. Now, the, what private equity uh, uh, in the U.S. is closest to is small cap and mid cap U.S. stocks, and small cap and, and, and mid cap U.S. stocks have returned 11% or so uh, before the financial crisis and same afterwards. So, if you measure private equity against a benchmark that is closest to it you will find just like a 1% outperformance, something of that magnitude in any decade. Now, people have a different view because they have compared it to like the S&P 500 returns, whereby the S&P 500 and any large cap weighted index have done extremely badly before the crisis. And that's why you had all these people like EDEC as well that created all these factors that, that consist basically at overweighting small stocks, equally weighting stocks, etc because the large caps have done extremely badly. So before the financial crisis, uh, private equity has been compared to large cap, and so the large cap were way below in terms of returns, but it's just because large cap were just being, having a very terrible decade. Uh, since the financial crisis, large cap have been doing very well, and private equity has done as well as large cap, and large cap has done as well as small and mid cap. Um, there is also another a benchmark that is used is MSCI World, uh, and MSCI World is mainly non-US and, and has very low returns because the non-US stocks have performed pretty badly over the last five years. And so that's why anything gets compared to the MSCI World because it's like the worst performing index out there. Uh, so again, if you compare private equity to the wrong indices, you will find all kinds of differences in returns and, and private equity may be better in most cases because you picked the indices that show that. Um, and all you choose choose performance metrics like IR that are just uh, uh, plain wrong. So if you compare it to comparable things, private equity has not done badly. It's, it's slightly above, but not by a huge lot. What is important is that they have charged 7% fees, which is by far the highest amount charged by anyone. A mutual fund charge is like 1 to 1.5%. All in, our private equity is at 6 7% for the average fund. And so, so that's why many institutional investors are trying to do private equity, but avoiding funds 
trying to do more co-investments and direct investments, et cetera, trying to avoid these financial intermediaries and still do private equity in order to get higher returns by squeezing the total amount of fees they pay. Uh, there is no evidence that they always do better. Like this, this idea that there is persistence is actually not not quite true. So, um, so there are some people who are doing better, but but it's always exposed. You will always find you know a stock that did better than the average. You will always find a mutual fund that did better than the average. Um, the question is ex ante: Were you able to predict who was going to do well? And and basically, if you do really an ex ante exercise in private equity, it's pretty hard to to spot who's going to do well. And if you look at the returns of investors in private equity, uh, most people don't really show their returns, but when you try to infer it the best you can, or that you look at people who do post their returns, they are all about the same numbers. I've, I've been pessimistic about private debt for four or five years, but been proven wrong every single year, right? So I think at one point there will be a catastrophe there, but, but I've been proven wrong so far. Uh, it doesn't mean it will not happen, but... Uh, so now I'm less loud about it, but you can find some old post of mine on LinkedIn predicting the next financial crisis will come from finance, from the private debt front. I will be careful with going into private debt and especially like funds that are levered in private debt. So like the American private debt funds tend to use leverage in order to lend even more. So it's like a private debt fund, but you borrow money in order to lend more. So it's leverage and leverage, like this kind of structure, I'll be very nervous to, to join as a as a young professional. You have some private debt funds that are a bit more established in Europe, but, but where we're that more careful at lending, et cetera, I would be a bit more uh, comfortable with them. Or else SQL, I, I'd be, I think private equity is gonna do better than private debt going, going forward, especially after this pandemic, because private equity has a hot hand, private debt have signed contracts that are very, very weak. I think it will keep on booming. I've, uh, I've, I've seen this. I've been working on it for 20 years, um, so that may influence my, my forecast. In, in, in the 21st century, there is not that much room for public markets. This idea that you need to trade stocks every millisecond and so on, I think like nobody is really buying this anymore, doesn't need really this. And so we're going to move to one gigantic private market auction-based, uh, where companies change hands. Uh, based on an auction with some intermediation, maybe. I, I don't give much hope to, to public markets, debt or equity. I, I think the, the future is in the private markets, but, but the private markets will have to change a lot because they have a lot of problems right now. Thank you, everyone, and, and, and good luck with everything.